Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's February 16th, and there are just 32 days until the first day of spring. Today, we celebrate a botanist of the American West and the husband of Kate Brandegee. We'll also learn about the woman who created the legislation for the New Jersey state flower, the violet. We'll hear some words about the role of the botanist from one of our horticultural greats. And we grow that garden library today with a book about transitioning from a beloved garden to something new. And this story is special. And then we'll wrap things up with a touching tribute to a gardener, a public servant, and a nursery owner. But first, I just want to take a second to remind you to head on over to Podchaser, if you get a chance, to leave a review for the show. And it's really so easy to do. All you need to do is head on over to podchaser.com, search for The Daily Gardener, and then leave a review. It's just that simple. I want to thank Marty Davis for leaving a review for the show. Marty wrote, I welcome the podcast every weekday. It's a bright, brief daily overview of garden highlights, including brief biographies of influential garden authors, designers, and practitioners. I love hearing events that have happened on this date, and the entire podcast helps me feel connected to the gardening concept and community. What a daily gift. Well, thank you, Marty. Your review is a gift to me and the show, so I really appreciate that. And then I wanted to share another review that came in. This one is by Earth Toady. I think that's how it's pronounced. Anyway, they wrote, love the Daily Gardener podcast. Jennifer finds interesting items about gardening past and present, along with other daily features that keep us coming back each day for more. I also love the Facebook page. There's There's lots of fun sharing of gardening experiences and wonderful photos by members of the Daily Gardener family. Well, thank you for that review as well. I truly appreciate all reviews of the show. And if you have a spare second this week to leave a review, I would greatly appreciate it. Here's today's curated news. Today's news is an article that was ran in the New York Times, and the title of the post is called How Selfish Are Plants? Let's Do Some Root Analysis, and it was written by Cara Gaimo. This post is interesting because there have been so many studies on the behavior of roots, of especially of plants that are planted close together versus planted far apart from each other. And the theory has always been that it's every plant for himself, that each plant is competing. And so you'll see that behavior reflected in the roots. However, this study came up with a different result. Here's what it said. A plant facing competition will underproduce those more expansive, wide ranging roots that might otherwise overlap with a neighbor plant, but it will overproduce roots closer to home, effectively consolidating power. So there you have it. Now, of course, this is just one model of one particular study, and there's a whole lot more information in this post if you'd like to check it out for yourself. But I did find the results of their model pretty compelling. In any case, if you would like to read this post for yourself, all you need to do is search for the word root in the Facebook group for the show and this post will pop right up. Now, if you're not in the Facebook group for the show, don't sweat it. It is so easy to join. All you need to do the next time you're on Facebook is search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here are today's brevities for February 16th. Today is the birthday of the American botanist Townsend Stith Brandegee, who was born on this day, February 16th in 1843. 
Townsend was born into one of America's oldest and prominent families, and he was the oldest of 12 children. Townsend's middle name, Stith, was his mother's maiden name. Townsend was descended from three generations of men named Elishima. Townsend's great-grandfather, Elishima Brandegee I, had fought in the Revolutionary War, and by 1778, he bought a pretty piece of land in Berlin, Connecticut, known as the Mulberry Orchard. The history of Berlin tells a charming story of how Townsend's great-grandmother Lucy made a red silk gown with the silk from her silkworms. Apparently, she'd intended to give the dress to Martha Washington, but somehow she ended up wearing it and keeping it for herself. The Brandegee family continued to grow mulberry trees on their property. In fact, Townsend's grandfather, Elishima Jr., founded the very first silk and cotton thread company in Berlin. A successful entrepreneur, Elishima Jr.'s mercantile store was the largest store between Hartford and New Haven, and people came from miles around to do their trading. Townsend's grandmother, Lucy, was a teacher and founded a private all-girls seminary, now a private prep school for girls known as the Emma Willard School. Townsend's father, Dr. Elishima Brandegee, became the town physician, and by all reports, he was beloved by everyone who knew him. Townsend and his dad shared a love of nature, and as a young boy, Townsend created his very own fern collection. Townsend came of age during the Civil War, and somehow he managed to live through two years of service in the Union Army. After his military service, like his father before him, Townsend attended Yale, and he graduated from Yale's Sheffield Scientific School. He forged his own path as a young civil engineer, and he ended up working on much-needed railroad surveys in the American West. In his spare time, both as a student at Yale and as a young engineer, Townsend botanized, and he even made some discoveries and sent specimens to Harvard's Asa Gray. Townsend's unique combination of surveying experience and botanical work proved invaluable as he began creating maps of the western forests. In fact, it was his love of forests that brought him to the greatest love of his life, Catherine Lane Curran. When his father died in 1884, Townsend's inheritance allowed him to pursue his interests without any financial worries. And in the late 1800s, if you were a young botanist with means and interested in West Coast botany, all roads led to the California Academy of Sciences. In her early 40s, Catherine Lane Curran was the curator of the Academy She'd been married to an alcoholic and then widowed in her 20s. She survived medical school when females were just breaking into the field of medicine, and she'd given up her career as a physician when it proved too difficult to set up a practice as a woman. By the time she met Townsend, the last thing Catherine had expected to find was love. And yet, these two middle-aged botanical experts did fall in love, insanely in love, to use Catherine's words, and to the surprise of their many friends, they married. Kate always referred to Townsend as Townie. Equally yoked, Townie and Kate's happy honeymoon was a 500-mile nature walk collecting plant specimens from San Diego to San Francisco. After their honeymoon, Townie and Kate moved to San Diego, where they created a herbarium, a library, and a garden, praised as a botanical paradise. 
1899, the jeweler Frederick Arthur Walton, who was reported to have the largest private cactus collection in England, visited Kate and Tony in San Diego. Frederick shared a review of the Brandigee's spectacular garden in his magazine called The Cactus Journal. He wrote, The garden of Mr. and Mrs. Brandigee is a wild garden being situated upon the mesa or high land overlooking the sea. Mr. and Mrs. Brandigee are enthusiastic botanists and have built a magnificent herbarium where they spend most of their time. The wild land around the herbarium is full of interesting plants that are growing in a state of nature while being studied and described in all their various conditions. Mrs. Brandigee has preserved specimens of all the kinds she can get. In some cases where the plants are very rare, I asked how she could destroy such beauties. And she replied that her specimens would be there to refer to at any time with all its descriptions and particulars, whereas if the plant had been left growing or sent to some botanical gardens, it would probably have died sometime and all trace would have been lost. Townie and Kate continued botanizing all through their lives, individually and together. And it's fun to know that during their lifetime, botanists could travel for free by train. And the Brandigies used these free passes regularly in their travels throughout California, Arizona, and Mexico. On one trip to Mexico, Kate left early and she managed to survive a shipwreck. And the story goes that Townsend asked about the fate of the specimens before asking about Kate. Yet this story shouldn't discount their very loving marriage. They were both just maniacally focused on their work. In 1906, when an earthquake destroyed the Berkeley Herbarium, it was the Brandigies who single-handedly restored it by donating their entire San Diego Botanical Library, including many rare volumes, and their entire herbarium of over 80,000 plants. Keeping in mind that Townsend's substantial inheritance had funded all of their botanical efforts, Townie and Kate requested a modest stipend of $100 per month in exchange for their life's work. Despite years of haggling, Berkeley never agreed to pay the Brandigies a cent for what was the richest private plant collection in the United States. Incredibly, the Brandigies continued to be selfless when it came to Berkeley. They followed their plants and their books to the campus, where Townsend and Kate worked the rest of their lives pro bono. And while Townsend was honored with the title of curator of the herbarium, Kate was not given a title. In the early spring of 1920, a 75-year-old Kate was walking at Berkeley when she fell and broke her shoulder. Three weeks later, she died. On April 7th, 1925, five years later, almost to the day, Townsend joined Kate on his final journey. And it was on this day, February 16th in 1971, that the New Jersey state flower, the violet, was officially adopted by the legislature after a proposal from Josephine S. Margitz. In 1967, when Josephine Margitz was elected to the New Jersey State Assembly, she became the first woman to represent Morris County, New Jersey, since 1938. Politics was in Josephine's blood. Her grandfather, a Pennsylvania Supreme Court justice, ran for governor of Pennsylvania, and Josephine's late husband, Walter T. Margitz Jr., served as New Jersey's state treasurer. 
a nursery and orchard owner, Josephine was environmentally conscious, and she introduced legislation to protect the land and waterways of New Jersey, even helping to ban the use of DDT. Long before Josephine was born, the violet was unofficially selected as the state flower of New Jersey, but by the late 1960s, New Jersey was the only state without legislation supporting an official state flower. And so, with the urging of local garden clubs, Josephine introduced legislation in February of 1971 to make the violet the official state flower of New Jersey. When it came time for Josephine's bill to be debated in the legislature, Josephine's peer, Senator Joseph J. Marazzetti, a Republican from Morris, read this poem. Roses are red, violets are blue. If you vote for this bill, Mrs. Margots will love you. Josephine's legislation was passed 30 to 1, and the sole dissenting vote was Senator Frank J. Guarini, a Democrat from Hudson. He told the press, I'm a marigold man. Two years later, in 1973, a newspaper called The Record out of Hackensack, New Jersey, shared an op-ed titled, Consider the Lilies of the Field. It said this, Conventional chauvinist wisdom would have it that Mrs. Margots introduced the bill because she's a woman, and women are, well, you know, interested in growing things, flowers and plants and trees, the fruit of the earth. But Mrs. Margots is not one of your everyday garden club ladies. She studied at the Ambler School of Horticulture. She operates a commercial apple and peach orchard in Pennsylvania, and she has a holly nursery on the grounds of her home in New Vernon. The house on the property is rather substantial for a Jersey farmhouse, if memory serves. It has 14 bathrooms, but no matter. Well, as Josephine no doubt knew, violets are spring flowers, and they've been around for a long time. The ancient Greeks enjoyed violets, and if you enjoy floriography or the symbolic meaning of plants, the heart-shaped leaves offer a clue to their meaning. Affection, love, faith, and dignity. The color of violets can add another layer of meaning. Blue violets especially symbolize love and devotion. White violets symbolize purity and yellow violets symbolize goodness and high esteem. In Unearthed Words, today's words are by Luther Burbank from his address to the Pacific States Floral Congress in 1901. Here's what he said. The chief work of the botanist of yesterday was the study and classification of dried, shriveled-up mummies whose souls had fled. They thought their classified species were more fixed and unchangeable than anything in heaven or earth that we can now imagine. We have learned that they are as plastic in our hands as clay in the hands of the potter or color on the artist's canvas— and can readily be molded into more beautiful forms and colors than any painter or sculptor can ever hope to bring forth. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Uprooted by Paige Dickey. This book came out in 2020. I bought my copy in November, and the subtitle is A Gardener Reflects on beginning again. When Margaret Roach reviewed this book, she wrote, an intimate lesson-filled story of what happens when one of America's best-known garden writers transplants herself, rooting into a deeper partnership with nature than ever before. 
If you've ever moved away from a beloved garden or there's a move in your future, you'll find Paige's book to be especially appealing. Uprooted is Paige's story about leaving her beloved iconic garden at Duck Hill, a landscape that she molded and refined for 34 years. Set on 17 acres of rolling fields and woodland, Paige's new property is in northwestern Connecticut, and it surrounds a Methodist church, which is how Paige came to call her new space Church House. What does it mean to be a seasoned gardener at the age of 74 and to have to start again? How does a gardener handle the transition from a beloved home to the excitement of new possibilities? Uprooted gives us the chance to follow Paige through all the major milestones as she finds her new home place. We get to hear about her search for a new place, how she establishes her new garden spaces, and her revelations as she learns to evolve as a gardener. If you've ever wondered how on earth you'll ever leave your garden, Paige will give you hope. And if you're thinking about revamping an old garden space or starting a new garden, you can learn from Paige how to create a garden that will bring you joy. As an accomplished garden writer, Paige's book is a fabulous read and the photography is top notch. And although the move from Duck Hill marked a horticultural turning point in her life, Paige found herself excited and re-energized by her brand new space at Church House. This book is 244 pages of the evolution of a gardener as she transitions from Duck Hill to Church House with a lifelong love of nature, gardens, and landscape possibilities. You can get a copy of Uprooted by Paige Dickey and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $18. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. As I was researching Josephine Margetts, the woman who introduced legislation for the state flower of New Jersey, the violet, I discovered that when she died in March of 1989, Fran Wood wrote a touching tribute to her that was featured in the Daily Record out of Morristown, New Jersey. And I thought you would enjoy hearing it, so I'm going to share it with you now. Snow was falling on the day they remembered Josephine Margetts last week. It was gathering in little drifts on the trees outside her back door, collecting on the glossy leaves of some 15 varieties of holly. The fresh flakes formed in little peaks on the bird feeders just inches away from her breakfast table, covered the glass roof of the greenhouse where lantana, gardenias, and scented geraniums had flowered for more winters than anyone could remember and accumulated along the fence rails next to the vegetable garden where she used to raise more produce than her family could eat in a summer. If the loving cultivation of these grounds, the perennials, the flowering shrubs and trees, and all those hollies she planted and nurtured had been Mrs. Margot's only accomplishment, it would have been worth remarking on, for gardening was a successful business as well as a private pleasure for her. Besides operating a licensed holly nursery on her home grounds, she and her family turned out some 10,000 bushels of peaches and apples each year at their Pennsylvania farm. Like all true gardeners, Mrs. Margots got tremendous satisfaction from planting a seed and watching it grow. She considered herself no less rewarded by those things that grew on their own accord, 
like the tiny white pine seedling that appeared in the middle of a flagstone path one spring. She hadn't the heart to pull it up, she said, and so it grew and grew until it rivaled the height of the tallest hollies and its expanding girth forced strollers to detour around it. Gardening was far from Mrs. Margot's sole accomplishment, of course, but her inherent appreciation for the beauty of the land and the miracles of nature were at the root of her environmental legacies to New Jersey. As a state assemblywoman, she sponsored New Jersey's first wetlands legislation, the Wetlands Act of 1970, aimed at protecting some of our most vulnerable saltwater areas. She also sponsored the Pesticides Control Act, the Municipal Conservation Act, the National Lands Trust, and the Appalachian Trail Easement, all bills whose goals were the preservation of natural resources. She also supported equal opportunity for women long before the word feminist was coined. But it was the environment, the beauty of nature, that stirred this farm girl most deeply, and her passion for it didn't lessen even in her last year or so when the plants nearest to her were Boston ferns, a Christmas cactus, and pots of ivy. And the closest she got to the outdoors were the vistas of lawns and gardens and trees seen through the windows of her room. During those months, she kept a small library of books within reach. Among them, Governor Tom Keene's The Politics of Inclusion, James Harriet's Dog Stories, The Fine Art of Political Wit, and several volumes detailing the laws of New Jersey. And in their midst were Cam Cavanaugh's Saving the Great Swamp, the Directory of Certified New Jersey Nurseries and Plant Dealers, New Jersey, a Photographic Journey by John Cunningham and Walter Koroszewski, and several well-worn and no doubt well-loved garden books. There was something symbolic about the snow that fell as Josephine Margetts was laid to rest last week. For as it covered the lawns and shrubs and gardens she knew and loved, it also blanketed every square inch of the state she knew and loved, and whose natural beauty and precious resources she worked so devotedly to preserve. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener, and remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. Hey, thanks for spending part of your day with The Daily Gardener. If you want to read even more botanical brevities, just head on over to thedailygardener.org. That's where you can find all the stories, biographies, and books that I share on the show. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. It has lots of goodies in it, and I try to make the newsletter like you're getting a marvelous letter from a garden friend. You can always find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Twitter and you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. Last but not least, you can easily share your gardener greetings or book submissions by emailing me at jennifer at the dailygardener.org. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely May Maple Grove in Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, and Eric Begay. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>